So the motion of the planets has another really interesting effect, which is called retrograde motion. And this was a, um, you know, something that the ancient astronomers had to try to explain. So they knew that most of the planets traveled along the ecliptic in the same direction for the most part. But sometimes if you take a picture uh, on the same night um, every day, um, then you can eventually notice that planets, I think this is Mars, sometimes appear to turn around and move backwards on the sky for a while and then turn around and move back in the correct direction again. And this must have been, you know, a huge mystery and probably added to the mystique of the planets being wanderers because they could do this whole moving backwards situation. None of the stars could do that. So how does this retrograde motion actually work? So one more time, starry night. And if we look at retrograde motion, so those are all, that's how the planets are actually moving here as we see them. And for the most part, when we look up at the sky, um, they appear to move along the ecliptic um, in, in the normal way, kind of uh, moving in the same direction as the sun does, you know, rising in the east, setting in the west. And that's what we call direct motion. But occasionally, if we look from night to night, then we'll notice that they will appear to pause and turn backwards. So keep an eye on Jupiter and Saturn here. And you'll see that now Saturn, it looks like it's slowing to a stop and now it's moving backwards. Jupiter is about to do the same thing. So those are now in retrograde. So just, you've now seen what the retrograde motion looks like, right? As kind of in sped up time, that turning backwards. And for, um, for the ancient astronomers, they thought that Earth was at the center of the universe and that the sun orbited Earth and that the celestial sphere and all the planets orbited Earth as well. And the you know, reason for that is pretty simple. It's because that's how it looks, right? So you can't blame them for thinking that this is the case. Um, but then this retrograde motion is a serious puzzle for that reason. So Ptolemy um, dealt with this problem of retrograde motion by adding these little circles so most of the planets here, um, Ptolemy said, orbited Earth, but they were also, as they orbited on this large circle, the deferent, they were also orbiting the deferent in these small circles, which he called epicycles. And so then you can see that if I'm here on Earth watching this planet, then when it's moving backwards on its epicycle, oops, it'll appear to be moving backwards on the sky. And then when it's moving forward in its epicycle, then it'll appear to be moving forwards on the sky. So this is, a, you know, a perfectly reasonable thing to think um, if you don't know anything else about the, you know, the forces that actually cause orbits to happen. And at that time, nobody did. And Ptolemy's system was very good at predicting the location of the planets. So it's a perfectly reasonable model if it actually does um, explain and predict those motions. Uh, but later on, um, Copernicus didn't like it. Um, for one thing, some of the calculations were good, but there were errors that had to be corrected um, by all these things like um, having different points for the center of the epicycle circle that were different from the center of the um, deferent circle. None of those were actually centered on the earth. So it just seemed unnecessarily complicated. Um, plus the predictions, um, you know, they just required too much to, to produce for the accuracy that they were giving. So Copernicus thought, I can do better than that. And if you, um, you know, simplify the system, then you can explain all of the same motions if you just assume that the sun is at the center and all the planets orbit the sun. Um, so this was Copernicus's model. Um, it was only published, uh, I think like a month before he died, probably because he was afraid to publish it. And in this case, there's only one thing that looks like an epicycle left, but that's just the moon in orbit around the earth. So this is Copernicus's original illustration. Um, and unfortunately, it did not make better predictions than Ptolemy's model um, because he assumed still that all of the planets moved in perfect circles, uh, but they actually don't. They move in ellipses, which are ovals. And so it didn't do much better at, uh, at making predictions for the locations of the planets. And if we look at um, kind of the Ptolemaic versus Copernican model, Starry Night, I think this one is the last one I'm going to share with you. 
um, it's pretty amusing to me. Um, so here we're looking down on the Earth, watching the planets in orbit around it. And you can see these loops that are being drawn. Those are the results of the um, epicycles. So if you were gonna trace out the motion of the planet, it kind of looks to me like a spirograph, right? Like it's taking one circle and making a small circle inside of it and, and tracing out these funny curly Q shapes. Um, and you know, it makes sense. You can see why if you're the earth looking out at one of these loops, how retrograde motion would be explained. But the heliocentric model explains um, retrograde motion perfectly fine as well. So here's the heliocentric model by comparison, probably more of what you're used to. And now if you're um, the earth and um, a planet, let's see, you're kind of like cars on a racetrack, right? So each planet is moving at a different speed. The inner planets are moving fast and the outer planets are moving really slowly. And in here as the earth catches up to Mars, if you were looking at Mars, right, as you pass Mars, then it's gonna appear to move backwards past you. Just like if you're a passenger in a car and you look out and you pass another car, it appears to move backwards as you pass. And so it's a perfectly natural explanation for retrograde motion that doesn't require all the epicycles. Um, here's what that looks like in the type of figure that we always see. So this figure uh, is super confusing, um, but if you take the time to kind of connect the places on Earth in Mars's orbit, all it's saying is that as Earth kind of catches up to the more slowly moving Mars at different points in space, it appears at different places on the background of stars. And so it appears to move backwards as we pass through points B through D, and then moves forward again as now Mars continues past us. All right, um, so this retrograde motion in the heliocentric model, if it doesn't make sense, you can try to reproduce this figure by kind of drawing it out yourself. And I think that could be a pretty helpful way to kind of physically get it. 